Hi, I'm Tessa Campbell, Senior Curator here at the Hebold Cultural Center at Tulalip. We have the special honor of presenting photographs many of you have never seen before. Edward S. Curtis took pictures of our relatives in the late 1890s. At our Hebold Museum, this beautiful photo of his welcomes you as you come in the front door. Edward S. Curtis took pictures of our relatives in the late 1890s. Many people know of Mr. Curtis, but not many people know that he came to Tulalip. Fortunately, we have these extraordinary photographs and Hebel friend Christy Christodoulides to help tell their story. My background is in art history. Um, I started out as a drawing and painting major at the University of Washington and then quickly fell in love with the art historical component as well. Um, and so I delved much into historic photography. That was one of my areas of focus. And after graduating, I went on to the, um, receive my master's from the UW in museum studies. So I spent a lot of my time cataloging and researching Edward Curtis's material, um, particularly for the University of Washington Special Collections and then I went on to work at the Burke Museum, um, researching their Edward Curtis material as well. Um, my thesis work focused on a branch of Curtis's photography as well known as the Oratone or Goldtone photograph. So he, he is close and dear to my heart and um, I've, I've spent a good amount of my time researching um, his life and his work. Several of his earliest images of Native American cultures were of Puget Sound Native cultures. Um, and it was in the year of 1896, actually, that uh, right around the time that his photographic career running a studio in Seattle really started to uh, take hold. He was becoming very popular for Seattle Society girls to come and take their portraits taken was when he first traveled up north to the Tlaloc Reservation. And some of his earliest images that went on to bring him national acclaim um, were taken near the Tlaloc Reservation. Um, there's Homeward Bound, uh, which is one of his most iconic images and one that he went on to use not only in his North American Indian project, um, but he would produce it in uh, silver border prints and uh, oratone photographs, other photographic techniques that he used to help promote the North American Indian. Um, so Homeward Bound is really striking because we see the dim outlines of five Salish figures in a West Coast style canoe at sunset. And they're silhouetted with this glimmering water and the clouds in the sky and they're coming up along the shores of Puget Sound. And this was awarded the grand prize in the National Photographic Society in 1898, which was one of the largest honors that you could achieve um, in photography at the time. And two additional works that also are Puget Sound natives, um, the Muscle Gatherer and the Clam Digger, which may have been photographed near Tulalip or in Seattle. Those were also um, given awards in picturesque genre studies, and all three traveled around the world in an exhibition. So it showed, um, it really, all three images captured the imaginations of the American public at the time. Um, and all three touched on this avant-garde artistic style at the time known as pictorialism. Um, so everything was supposed to be just these beauty, beautiful and moody images. Um, and so that's, that's Homeward Bound. In this particular one, it's the West Coast style canoe. And we see these in other images that we'll be talking about on the Tulalip Reservation, but it's an ocean-going canoe and a style that was adopted by the Tulalip and other Puget Sound Salish cultures at the time. Um, traditionally, they would use a different type of canoe, but the West Coast style canoe was better for uh, freight and moving in more open waters rather than protected inlets. So we see this canoe with its very iconic, uh, what's known as a wolf head uh, bow. And so it has 
more of a projecting snout and ears. And in this particular image of Homeward, the, the ears seem to be not quite there, but it is that same type of canoe. The same family was depicted in several other images with different names that appeared within the same volume, volume nine of the North American Indian. There is no definitive landmark, which is what makes it so challenging. And in letters of correspondence that Curtis had later on towards the end of his life in the late 1940s with Harriet Leach, who was a then volunteer of the Seattle Historical Society, she had, they had received um, a set of the North American Indian and she was surprised to learn that she could still correspond with the artist. So when she wrote to him, um, that was when he said, she asked him, where did you get your start with native cultures? And he said it was 1896 and it was by traveling to Tulalip that I had my start. And um, that was um, some of the images that we'll be talking about. We know definitively um, based upon their copyright information or in the case of one image, you will see the, the, uh, the landmark of Tulalip Bay. But these, yes, it's a little bit harder to say where exactly in Puget Sound they would have been photographed. So aside from these faint images um, of Homeward and the Muscle Gatherer and the Clam Digger, there is a handful of other photographs that exist that we know that captured the Salish cultures residing on the Tulalip. And while three of these photos bear a copyright date of 1898, um, the Negas were likely taken in 1896 or 97, um, as Curtis mentions in that 1940s correspondence. So one such photo resides within the holdings of the Tulalip's um, Hebop Cultural Center and it depicts two women as they walk along the shoreline of Tulalip Bay. Um, both women are wearing traditional hard-coiled pack baskets on their backs and they're secured across their chests with these very durable, flexible woven tump lines. Um, a culturally essential and powerful art form, the Puget Salish maintain a strong tradition of these coiled basketry throughout times of contact and they went on to be um, created with continuing enthusiasm because of the demand amongst white collectors um, at the time, at the turn of the last century. Um, and by their very nature, these types of coiled baskets um, were closely interwoven into the environment of the Puget Sound um, culture's lives. It not only reflected their practical needs, um, originally as cultures that were grounded in hunting and fishing and gathering. It also um, reflected um, in their designs uh, a reference to the natural environs. So you would have seen things such as uh, geometric images that reflected the rising mountains or the gills of the salmon or the flaring fronds of a fern. Um, and the large scale pack baskets that were worn by both of these women in the shoto uh, in the photo would have been woven from western red cedar. The roots for the coiled foundations and the bark um, for elements within the imbricated decoration. Also bear grass, which is a member of the lily family, would have been gathered and then bleached white in the sun and that would have been used as part of the decorative material in the imbrication of the designs. Um, and the design that we see present on the right basket um, is a very old design, um, and it's one that uh, is a, a repeating meander pattern that runs in vertical um, columns around the basket. And the same pattern is actually present on one of the earliest hard-coiled baskets that's ever been recorded provenance-wise, collected in 1841 in the Puget um, Sound by the Wilkie's Expedition. So it it's, uh, shows a long-standing tradition amongst the Tulalip with that design. This type of basket would have been something that they would not have put something that had water. So the clams probably not because you traditionally with those you would have seen an open weave that would allow the water and sand and dirt to filter out. But these would probably have been for um, gathering of berries or other type of um, reeds and then they would have been bringing back to um, 
a camp for uh, processing. A Curtis photograph that's housed at the University of Washington Library Special Collections um, provides us with another glimpse into the rituals of daily life and cultural knowledge that was present at the Tlalip. So amongst the western style uh, gable roof dwellings that we see with vertical plank walls in the image, there's a, several other types of historic Salish canoes that are parked on the beach. So in the distance on the left side, um, we see a Puget Sound Salish canoe that was developed and perfected to um, suit the everyday local transportation needs within the sheltered waters. And it has a very graceful and sleek silhouette and it's recognizable with its long tapered bow and the rounded cutwater um, and the overhanging stern at the back. And canoes were very central to the lives of the Puget Salish and very uh, spiritual vessels. They were created from a century old um, western red cedar logs, which was a highly venerated tree amongst uh, the Puget Sound cultures. And um, the canoe that we have in the front um, is known as a west coast or northern style canoe. And this type of canoe was adapted in the, or adopted in the early 1870s uh, by the Salish um, as a way to assist them with fishing and freight that was out on more choppy um, waters. And it's the type of canoe that would have been used by the Tulalip when they traveled down south to Seattle to trade along the waterfront. Um, and then we also see in the um, image um, a type of basketry that was also traditionally woven um, amongst the Tulalip. And it's hanging in the rafters and um, stored beneath the middle houses overhanging porch are these soft mats that were crafted from cattails. Um, they were vital for various reasons. They were used for um, insulation within the cedar plank homes, for bedding, for seating, um, for placing inside the canoes during travel. And they were woven from rows of the reeds um, by means of a long triangular elk bone or a wooden needle that was threaded with cord and then a mat creaser would have been used to smooth and flatten out the fibers. Traditionally, it would have been um, more of a long style, um, also cedar planked siding, but the roofs would have been flat where they could also um, easily move the planks around and weight them down with rocks to allow if they were cooking inside, the smoke would be able to escape. By this point, um, you're talking about the turn of the last century, and they had adopted more of the Western style homes. And you still see the remnants of the cedar plankings that was used for the side, but the, the pitches of the homes were much more um, European um, when being the pitched um, style that wouldn't have been they would no longer have been able to move around the, the planks. We know from the um, negative number, um, which is shown in the bottom left corner, that it's 898. And um, like the other images, they're all in a very close series. We know that another image that I'll be talking about later um, does show two tribal, Tulalip tribal elders on a porch outside, very much like that's shown in um, this image. So we do know that uh, rather conclusively that this would have been taken at Tulalip. And we can see that it's along the, the beach line, but I have not been able to find any other images that were actually taken at this time period on the Tulalip Reservation. Curtis was certainly one of the earliest. He really tried to create these um, portraits that would capture the essence of the sitter. But he also was very interested in documenting the types of dwellings and the traditional art forms that all of these cultures across North America had. So we do see throughout the North American Indian and there are less known images, but he would document um, a simple dwelling or pottery being um, baked along uh, coals. 
and he would do it without people there because he wanted to show what the current state of, of their living was. Um, and I think it shows a really fascinating sliver into each of these tribal cultures at the time. So I think with this image, he wanted to show a snapshot of what those 22 tribes that had been congregated onto this reservation after the treaty, he wanted to show their, their, the way they lived day to day. This is the one of the Snohomish grave house within volume nine of the North American Indian, which focused on the Salish cultures of the Northwest coast. Curtis included this image of the uh, Snohomish grave house, which would have been taken on the Tlalip reservation. And while you can see within the photographer version that the image was officially copyrighted in 1912, I believe that the image was probably still taken early within his career around the 1896 or 97 period when we know that he did definitively travel up to the Tlaloc Reservation. Um, and then he copyrighted it at the time that volume nine would have been going to production. So around that 1912 period. Um, and in the photograph, we see a very simple low lying structure that's nestled amongst these sweeping bows of the forest. Um, it's with a pitch roof of wooden planks and there's no walls but it, you can see buried beneath this um, pitch roof structure, um, simple cedar boxes. And starting by the mid 19th century, um, the Puget Sound Salish were um, taking their ancestors once they pass and they'd wrap them in blankets and then inter them in these cedar boxes. So it's a very uh, touching image and um, one that um, when you know the, the background of, I think it gives it even more significance to the viewer. Many times throughout Curtis's career, he was able to gain access to these um, traditions, to these burial practices, to ceremonial dances that um, many photographers would not have been able to do and it came down to his personality, his ability to try to make, um, to engage with the cultures he was interacting with and show them respect and um, reverence and wanting to wholeheartedly want to be able to document their way of life and, and capture it for perpetuity for future generations. Um, but it's uh, a really great image because it provides us with an impression of the day-to-day -day endurance um, of the Tlalip. And so we see seated on a small porch, um, Magdalene Wandakum, who was the mother of Snohomish cultural leader and carver William Shelton. Um, as well as Alice Gus, and they're both in the act of preparing hand-spun, natural-colored sheep um, wool yarn. So the practice of working with wool was a very long-standing tradition within the Puget Salish community, dating back thousands of years. Previous to contact with European explorers and missionaries, wool would be gathered and prepared from mountain goats and from a small, specially bred um, dog with long, woolly white hair. So with the introduction of livestock, sheep's wool became the primary source for women's textile work and Salish weaving began to adapt and absorb these newly introduced um, techniques such as knitting. So in the photograph, um, Alice is shown hand carding the collected sheep's wool to clean and disentangle the fibers and her uncarded wool is gathered in a hard coiled cedar basket at her feet. Um, it also shows that same type of abstracted decoration that would reference the natural world. So in this case, it's known as a sword fern decoration that's on that basket. Um, Magdalene sits at a spinning wheel and she is spinning the carded wool into natural yarn in preparation of the knitting. Um, and at Tlalip, the knitting of high quality thick woolen socks, such as we see in bundles um, at their feet 
within the foreground of Curtis's image. Uh, it was a primary source of income for the families um, at this time, and they would sell them to loggers and farmers, and um, later even to Eddie Bauer himself for his premier outdoor clothing uh, goods store in downtown Seattle. This one's copyrighted 1898, so, but the same, my theory is that it was probably taken within a couple years earlier of that. He wouldn't necessarily copyright them the same year that he photographed them. They are wearing um, non-traditional clothes, the type of clothes that they were wearing by the late 19th century. Um, so they were uh, creating clothes now from calico or printed cotton cloth that they would um, have traded for or purchased. Um, and then shawls over their shoulders and handkerchiefs, same thing printed from printed calico was very common for the women to be wearing at that time. I do feel like this was an image that he probably came upon both of them and uh, found their you know, methodical um, and rhythmic working pattern to be of interest. And so he, he captured them perfectly, I think. They're hard at work um, and it was a way for them to make a living at that time. So I, I think it was probably a daily activity for them, at least at this time of year. I think it's probably uh, fall. It would make sense if all of the images were taken at the same time um, for them to have been using their baskets for gathering, um, like in that first image. That's a thing that they would have more likely have done in that fall time period. Like Homer, the clam digger and the mussel gatherer were um, the ones that toured around the world after um, gaining honors, or in the case of Homer, the gold medal at the 1898 convention. The mussel gatherer and the clam digger, it's hard to say. Um, there's talk that both of those images depict Princess Angeline, but um, she did pass away in 1896, so time period-wise, um, both would uh, certainly work, but it's unlikely that they were taken at the Tulalip, but they might have um, been taken near the Tulalip Reservation. He not only documented the cultures by photography, he also did sound. He created over 10,000 wax cylinders of their um, songs, and um, he, beating in the spring of 1904, he started filming as well. So um, that dedication meant that the process took much longer than he anticipated. And by the time that 1930 came, when his last volume was printed, the vast amount of American culture was no longer interested in imagery that documented Native cultures. So it's, it's a sad, sad story in the end that he was largely forgotten. But um, luckily now, his work's been brought back to the limelight. And love it or not, um, it does add a significant um, record uh, to the whole history of Native cultures and shows a window into things that we don't necessarily have known if it wasn't for his writings and for his photography. The Curtis photos of the Tulalip Reservation have given us a fascinating window into the world of our ancestors, how our families lived and worked. The Hebold Cultural Center mission is to revive, restore, protect, interpret, collect, and enhance the history, traditional cultural values, and spiritual beliefs of the Tulalip tribes. And this is what we do at Tulalip. Thank you to Christy and to all of our Tulalip friends. Most importantly, we thank Mr. Curtis for his treasured photographs.